There was a heavy police presence on Detroit's west side after another drag racing incident. Plus in the hot seat, President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, questioned by members, staff members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, what he has said so far about the Russian collusion concerns. Brandon? After a long-lasting summer sizzle, the look and feel of fall, cool and cloudy Monday. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. And topping our news at noon, the Detroit Police Department cracking down on the drag racing in the city. And as you can see here, the latest incident was last night on Detroit's west side. That's where Local Force Coco McAvoy joins us now to tell us how this situation unfolded. You can still see the donut marks here on Grand River after the drag racing incident. Police say it appears it seems to be happening more often, and they say it's a safety concern and a headache for them. This was the scene on Grand River Avenue after another night of drag racing. Ken Holloman was there as a bystander. A lot of drag racing, a lot of traffic jam backed up, so we ran our bikes and cruised around and seen a, a large crowd of tires, rubber, rubber flying and tires going, smoking and everything. Detroit Police Captain Darren Selegi says this started as a street party. Several hundred people, several hundred motor vehicles, including uh, motorcycles and uh, ATVs, mini bikes, you know, kind of can uh, descended on the area of Grand River between Livernois and Oakman. Then the drag racing began and it quickly got out of hand. But it was within tight quarters. There's no safety parameters. There's people lined up and down the sidewalk. If one of the cars loses control, it's one of those situations where we're apt to have a fatality. Fortunately, no one was injured this time around, but police are trying to figure out how to handle the drag racing problem and encourage people to stop turning streets into racetracks. Every year we do this, someone ends up a fatality every year from this. I get it, it's a car culture, we are Detroit, but we have venues you can do it safely. And police say several cars were ticketed and towed. On Detroit's west side, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. Right now we want to get to a developing story that we're following from Switzerland. That's where police are searching for a man who injured office workers in a chainsaw attack. It was just after a health insurance agency office opened in a town in northern Switzerland when the man with the chainsaw burst in and attacked workers. Five were injured, two have had surgery, all thankfully are expected to survive. Police say the incident was not terrorism. Investigators do say that they know the man that they're looking for. They describe him as psychologically unstable. President Trump's son-in-law is being questioned by staff members of the Senate Intelligence Committee about possible campaign collusion with Russia. The 36-year-old left his Washington, D.C. home en route to the Capitol a little after 9 o'clock. Kushner volunteered to meet with the committee, where he's expected to tell them that he had been unaware that a June 2016 meeting he attended at Trump Tower was set up in the hopes that a Russian lawyer would provide the Trump campaign with damaging information about Hillary Clinton. Kushner went to the meeting at the request of the president's oldest son, Donald Trump Jr. In a prepared statement, Kushner claims he did not read an email forwarded by the younger Trump, saying that the Russian government was providing dirt about Mrs. Clinton as part of its effort to help the Trump campaign. He did acknowledge that after the November election, he sought a direct line of communication to the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. He characterized that action as a routine part of his job in establishing foreign contacts for Mr. Trump's transition team. In his prepared remarks, Kushner flatly denied any collusion with the Russian government. And after he wraps up today's meeting with the Senate Intelligence Committee, Kushner will answer more questions tomorrow coming from the House Intelligence Committee. Both panels are probing Russian interference in the 2016 election and contacts between Russia and Trump campaign officials and associates. Of course, you want to stick with us here on Local 4 and on ClickOnDetroit.com for the outcome of those meetings. Well, turning to weather now, we had a cloudy and, and cooler morning, looking more like fall in July than really summer. Are the, uh, the clouds going to stick around, Brandon? I think they will, but not for too much longer, and they'll make all the difference in the world. Currently, yeah, it feels and looks a lot like fall or just 
unlike the last 10 days or so around here. Temperatures in the 60s everywhere. In fact, struggling in the 60s in our north zone, probably not getting out of the 60s and comparing noon temperatures today to noon temperatures on Sunday, 24 hours ago. We are anywhere between 5 and about 15 degrees cooler just in the 24 hour period and staying that way with the clouds and these winds. These winds are responsible for keeping the feels like temperature a little bit cooler, but dragging those clouds in and keeping them with us. Even a chance for a little bit of spit and drizzle up in our north zone and over parts of southern Ontario. Not any heavy rain here, but just enough to notice or use the windshield wipers for here and there again up in our north zone 69 now to 72 at 2 o'clock 4 o'clock high temperature. We break apart the clouds just enough for a few peaks of sun right around 75 degrees. And again, you can see the clouds and even a little bit of light rain trying to show up near Port Huron over parts of southern Ontario. We'll watch the sun return and temperatures respond in your seven day forecast that is all coming up. If you uh, need the forecast in a hurry, we've got you updated on the local forecasters app. Detailed discussion there. A look at the radar to avoid this afternoon's drips as well. Alrighty, thank you, Brandon. Let's go to Madison Heights now, where the investigation into the death of a man in a motorized wheelchair who was hit by a car continues. This happened around 530 this morning. Police saying the victim fell off of his motorized scooter onto Quinder near 11 Mile when he and the scooter were hit by a car. Now, the man who was on the scooter sadly died. The driver did stop and has been cooperating with police. The victim has not been identified just yet. And a fire that started this morning in a vacant apartment building on Detroit's west side grew to a three alarm blaze. The building at Woodrow Wilson and Gladstone went up in flames around 3 a.m. No injuries were reported and there's no word yet on how this fire started. A week of remembrance and reflection continues here in Detroit this week as Detroiters marked 50 years since the explosion of violence many call the Detroit riots. It started back on July 23rd, 1967 and ended with 43 people dead, more than 1400 buildings burned and deep scars on the city and its history. On Sunday, a memorial plaque was unveiled at Detroit's Gordon Park to commemorate the event and honor those who suffered through it. Now, the cast of the movie Detroit, which focuses on events in the city 50 years ago, they're touring the city of Detroit today. And beyond promoting the movie, they're also helping Detroit celebrate its 316th birthday today by visiting sites around town and pitching in, joining the efforts at Gleaner's Food Bank and even visiting local restaurants. The movie Detroit has its world premiere tomorrow night at the Fox Theater, and we are expecting a very large turnout. All right, so to come here on Local 4 News at noon, troubling allegations by members of an evangelical church here in North Carolina are being accused of human trafficking. Details on that, plus searching for justice. Charges filed today against a truck driver after 10 people die after being blocked, locked in the back of a sweltering tractor trailer. We'll tell you why authorities are looking to make more arrests when we come back. Welcome back in Afghanistan. The Taliban claiming responsibility for a car bombing in Kabul that killed at least 30 people. The car bomb struck during the morning rush hour and happened next to a bus that was carrying Afghanistan government workers. 42 other people were injured. Kabul has been the scene of several deadly car bombings in recent months with claims of responsibility from the Taliban and the Islamic State. Here a little closer to home now. Today, the Florida truck driver arrested after 10 people died when they were locked in the back of a sweltering tractor trailer outside of a Texas Walmart. It's formally charged, charged with transporting immigrants in the U.S. illegally, resulting in the deaths of 10 people. And this is all as authorities are looking to make even more arrests. Sarah Rosario joins us now with what we know of the survivors. We're just getting this information in with that death toll now at 10. We're told that there are 16 remaining survivors still listed in the hospital under critical condition. Today, officials confirm that several of them are from Mexico and Guatemala. A gruesome discovery, 10 dead in San Antonio, Texas, leaving a community in shock. And federal investigators today searching for answers. Who all is involved in the truck smuggling of undocumented immigrants? And where are the other victims who ran when police were called? Uh, checking the video from the, from the store, we found that uh, there were a number of vehicles that came in and picked up uh, a lot of the folks that were in that trailer. 
that survived the trip. A sweltering ride trapping the victims inside the trailer with no AC and temperatures reaching more than 100 degrees. In all, 39 people were rescued when a Walmart employee called 911 after someone escaped begging him for water. They were very hot to the touch, so these people were in that trailer without any signs of any type of water. The suspected driver, 60-year-old James Bradley Jr. of Clearwater, Florida, is expected in court today. This is the latest in four other truck smuggling cases this month in Texas alone. In 2003, 19 immigrants died locked inside a truck in Victoria, Texas. And we pray. Now with pop-up protests and vigils. They're willing to risk themselves and they're willing to risk their lives for their kids and for their family members. It's renewing calls for immigration reform. It's a symptom of a broken immigration system. A fight that rages on. Sarah Rosario, Local 4. An investigation by the Associated Press reports an evangelical church in North Carolina enticed members in Brazil to come to the U.S. where they claim they did slave labor. The Word of Faith Fellowship Congregation is based in Spindale, North Carolina, and several members of its church in Brazil say they were urged to move to the main church using tourist or student visas. They told the AP that they were forced to work at various jobs without pay, and in some cases they were beaten for speaking out. Church members not commenting right now. Federal prosecutors, however, are investigating. And there has been a major development in the story of an 11-month-old 11 11 -month Charlie Gard, the terminally ill British boy with a rare genetic condition. Charlie's parents had appealed to a British court to take him to the U.S. for experimental treatment. But today they withdrew that request, saying it's too late for treatment. They say they want to use what time they have left to be near their son. Private discussions will take place to determine when life support will be turned off. All right, still to come here on Local 4 News at noon, a rare case of remission in a patient with HIV. How this report holds promise for those impacted by the illness. Brandon? All the cool, cloudy skies over the area aren't going anywhere anytime real soon. Even a couple of drips and drops, parts of Lapeer, Oakland County. But as we look ahead, here comes the sun and temperatures responding. Next. We're going to have an ambulance to come and take a look at you, all right? Just, no, no, just stay, just stay, just stay. No, no, no. We're good. Don't push me. Get back. Brian? Nope, you stay out here. Hi, this is over. Welcome back. Strong storms knocked out power and even damaged several buildings along Maryland's eastern shore from overnight. More than 7,000 customers lost electricity when those storms, which were pushed by powerful winds, just blew right through the area. Thankfully, no serious injuries were reported. But local public safety officials might send out a survey team to determine if the storm led to a tornado. And take a look at the flash flooding that hit parts of South Carolina last night. While there were no injuries reported here either, firefighters in Columbia, South Carolina, were called out to rescue at least one driver who was stuck in, the, in their car in the midst of all this flood water. Several roads were shut down, and the region might be getting more showers and thunderstorms today. Quite a different scene here, Brandon, here in Detroit and southeast Michigan. We are just experiencing, what, fall-like weather. I'm, I'm not complaining about the temperatures today. <laughs> and some people may be because it is their week to head up north or maybe just have the week off and visit the beach and pool. But there was some wet weather around over the weekend, including some strong storms. Yesterday, most of it was downriver and into uh, Monroe County. But here's a look at one of our local four storm pins. And this one coming at us from the Trenton, Michigan area. And what looks like a storm producing a little funnel cloud there, at least the bottom of that cloud dropping out a little bit could have just been some rain cooled air or a pouch of cooler air dropping from the bottom of that thunderstorm, but a great 
shot there. Our local four storm pins is a free app, and this is the exact reason why we have it. We want to show folks who are perhaps in the line of fire what could be coming your way as we uh, sort of use the social media effect of storm pins. Free app under WDIV. 69 degrees out there. That is it. Northwest winds are 13 and occasionally those winds are gusting a little bit stronger. We have some areas like Mount Clemens right now gusting over 20 miles an hour. Same down in Adrian. The rest of us are just dealing with pretty consistent 15 mile an hour winds or so. And so if you are heading to the Tigers game tonight, finally back in town after a couple of uh, road series in Kansas City and Minnesota, 7-10 tonight, Verlander on the hill against the Royals once again. Temperatures in the low 70s falling down into the 60s. And although it's not really uh, cold weather for jackets and things like that, our bodies get used to the heat and humidity like we had last week. And it could be a little bit of a struggle. So some of the kids or some of you may want that sweatshirt or long sleeve shirt for tonight. Should be a dry one other than a little bit of spit and drizzle between now and about 6 o'clock. That's about it. 75 degrees with cloudy to mostly cloudy skies in our north zone areas north of M59. Best chances to get a little bit of that drizzle activity overnight. Dry conditions, very, very comfy sleeping weather down to about 59 degrees and Tuesday night into Wednesday. Another pretty good sleeping night. So we mentioned a couple of areas of drizzle and we see that here coming off of Lake Huron with these north winds and that is why we have sort of picked this area north uh, zone and into southern Ontario as having the best chances for just a little bit of wet weather insult to injury. Air is flowing counterclockwise behind this area of low pressure that's bringing the soaking rains to the northeast, but we get the cool air coming out of Canada uh, and that will start to fade as we head through the overnight and into tomorrow. So we do expect plenty of Tuesday sunshine. Also, as we head into Wednesday here on the computer model, not a whole lot showing up. Thursday, a little frontal passage and no guarantees here that we're going to get showers and storms. We could use some wet weather. We always say that during the summertime, but other than a little drip today, nothing tomorrow. 80 degrees Tuesday, 84 on Wednesday, feeling the humidity a little bit. Thursday again, midday rain and thunder chances here. Isolated go of a storm on Friday, although again, not real likely in the weekend ahead. Looks very nice, Evrod, but very dry. A little bit of sun and a little bit of rain. Brandon, we like that. In good health now, researchers are reporting a rare case of remission. Remission in a patient with HIV. A South African girl born with the AIDS virus got early treatment with an anti-HIV drug, and the infection has remained suppressed eight years after she stopped taking the drugs. The report holds promise for children born with HIV. All right, still to come here on Local 4 News at Noon, a very unique graduation ceremony in Mississippi. We'll tell you why these dogs are wearing caps and gowns.